Ever felt stuck in a cycle, trying to swap out those pesky habits? Enter Fume, your new best friend on this journey. And just to be clear, this isn't some mystical chant your artsy neighbor Jenna does during her moonlit yoga sessions. This is about a groundbreaking approach to habits. With Fume, it's all about embracing the good. Forget those electronic gadgets that promise the world and deliver little. Fume is grounded in nature. Imagine taking a deep breath of air, but it's flavored. And not just any flavor, but all natural tantalizing ones that make you wonder why you didn't try it sooner. The design of Fume isn't just functional, it's therapeutic. With its adjustable airflow and interactive parts, it's more than just a device. It's a calming companion for those moments when life gets a tad overwhelming. And speaking of flavors, Fume's new cores are a sensory delight. The orange vanilla is nostalgia in a breath, reminiscent of sunlit picnics. Raspberry lemon? Think of a zesty summer afternoon in a meadow, and the sparkling grapefruit is like a refreshing morning splash. When I first got my hands on Fume, I was curious but cautious. The result? A delightful surprise. The flavors were richer than I imagined, and the device? It felt like a crafted piece of art, balanced, elegant, and oh so satisfying to hold. If you're looking for a sign to make a change, this is it. Fume isn't just a product, it's a movement. With a community of over 100,000 and growing, it's clear that Fume is onto something special. Ready to dive in? Head over to tryfume.com slash Donovan Dread. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com slash Donovan Dread and use the code Donovan Dread for a cool 10% off the journey pack. In the grand scheme of things, it's not about giving up but moving forward. And with Fume, that journey looks a whole lot brighter. Join the movement and breathe the difference. I'm a park ranger. I've been working at Yellowstone National Park for going on a decade now. I've always loved the wild and having the chance to protect. It is a privilege. I'm especially drawn to caring for the wildlife and maintaining its resources. In the park, we got everything from massive elk herds to the tiniest birds. We have regular campers and first-time visitors, miles and miles of trails, and natural wonders that keep even the grumpiest teenagers in awe. Anyway, this happened on a sunny summer's day. I was doing my usual rounds, checking that the campsites were clean, the trails were clear, and that no one was harassing the wildlife. I like these routines, and I get to spend time in the wild whilst ensuring that everything is as it's supposed to be. It's nice and predictable, usually. I also mingle a lot with our rangers and park staff. Ellen, a new recruit who was having a tough time adjusting from city life, was amused and slightly petrified of the regular telltale signs of bears and wolves. We had a laugh about that. Then there was Buddy, an old hand at the park with a somber streak who'd make weird observations like, dang it, nobody respects poison oak anymore. Later, I was back at the ranger station, going over some maps and reports. We had a weird uptick in complaints. People were talking about strange noises at night, scary deep growls, and howling like they've never heard before. We have wolves, sure, but these descriptions were just not fitting the bill. Sounds like a pack of wolves on steroids, if you ask me. Now most of us just chalked it up to overactive imaginations, or maybe some newcomers getting their first real taste of wilderness sounds at night. But Buddy, he pulled me aside. He's been around longer than anyone else. He's usually quiet, but when he chooses to speak, everyone listens. He gets this real serious look on his face, and tells me that he's heard something similar before, back in his early days at the park. I heard him again last night, he said quietly. He began to explain in hushed tones. Strange howls and growls I ain't heard in years. Makes the wolves seem like puppies. I was floored. Buddy wasn't the type to joke around. And from the look on his face, it was clear that he was scared. Gave me the chills, to be honest. There was a legend from years back about a creature that resided deep within the park. Most of us knew the tales, but dismissed them as just spooky campfire stories to scare the new guys, or tall talks for the tourists. But now, Buddy was insisting that we consider it, and he was sure it was acting out after years of silence. Maybe it was the serious and fearful tone of his voice, 
the way he insisted on me considering his words, or the tinge of betrayal in his eyes. But believe me or not, I was left intrigued. Well, it looks like I spoke too soon when I said I hadn't directly encountered the creature. I thought seeing the folk say their piece was going to be the last of it for the day. It wasn't even an hour later, I stumbled upon a strange sight. I was walking along a trail on a routine check, enjoying the peaceful evening. At first, I didn't think much of it. Heard a rustling sound from beyond the trees, probably a deer or a rabbit, I thought. Then, I noticed that far-off smell like a decomposing animal or something. I chalked it up to the wind carrying scents from elsewhere. I was about to move on when a low, rumbling growl echoed through the forest. Not your typical wolf or bear growl, it was deeper, a lot deeper. Gave me the chills. Must be the overactive imagination Buddy had infected me with earlier. Being the curious man that I am, I decided to have a look, and boy, nothing prepared me for what I saw. There it was, a gigantic hulking figure, standing erect, like a man on two legs, but broader, with a muscular humpback. It was silhouetted against the setting sun, and it had this massive mane, flowing off its shoulders like a cape. From the side, I saw it had the shaggiest dark hair I'd ever seen on a living creature. Looked brown, or possibly black. Hard to tell in that light. Sprouting from the top of its head were pointy ears, and in front, a snout that looked weirdly long for a wolf or bear. My heart was racing. I thought of approaching it, you know, ranger duty and all. But something in me said that was a bad idea. So, I did the next best thing. I retreated slow and quiet, not wanting to attract its attention. After I was at a safe distance, I turned and broke into a jog, then a full-blown sprint. Once I reached the ranger station, I shut the doors tight, told my guys to stay in for the night. No one questioned me, guess my expression said it all. That encounter, or observation, whatever you might call it, changed everything for me. It felt like I was looking at the park with a new set of eyes, as if peeled back a layer revealing a world I didn't know existed till today. Bet you didn't expect you'd bait this kind of story out of me, huh? Wish I had been making this all up. Would have been easier on my nerves. Well, take care, Donovan. I'll touch base soon. Need some time to digest this encounter. Hey, Donovan. I'm a big fan of the show and have been listening for ages now. You always say to email in if we've got a story to share. Well, I've gotten one that's been playing on my mind late at night. Now, I work a 9 to 5 and tend to stay out a few extra hours getting things done. So I'm used to returning home late. This incident took place on a cold January evening. The sky was clear and a thin, waning crescent was the only source of light above. You know, it was one of those nights where you can see your breath every time you exhale. A Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. I live in a semi-rural area in Kentucky, the kind of place where everyone knows your name but still gives you space. Being a mechanic by trade, long days and late nights come with the territory. I'm not too bothered about it most times. But that night, particularly, I was beat. The boss had us working on cars for 12 straight hours, and I was dreaming about my bed the entire drive home. I'd parked my beat-up Chevy in the driveway as usual and sat there for a moment in the still darkness grateful for the quiet. There's something about the quiet in Kentucky, especially at night. It's almost sacred, like time has paused for a moment and you're the only one left awake in the world. After a few moments of peace, I pulled myself out of the truck and locked it up. The glow from the porch light was a beacon pulling me forward, but the promise of hot food and rest kept my sluggish legs moving towards the house. Mild dread followed as I remember leaving a mountain of dirty dishes in the sink that morning. I silently chastised myself, already predicting the reek of leftover fast food after a full day. As I trudged up the steps and fumbled for my keys, I heard a strange noise. It was a soft click, click, click. You know like when two stones tap together? Kind of like that, but eerier. I paused, turned off my music, and concentrated. Sure enough, it was real and not a figment of my exhausted mind. My first guess was the wind tapping some loose branches against each other. But I quickly discarded that idea 
as I remembered the stillness of the evening. Then I thought it might be some neighbor's dog or some other animal. I was too tired to investigate, so I shrugged it off. I meant to take a step forward but froze when I saw a quick movement in the corner of my eye. My keys slid from my grasp, clattering against the porch steps. Something was moving in the yard. Just as I bent over to pick up my keys, that's when I saw it. God, it was something else. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try my best. There in the flickering shadows cast by the porch light was a figure. At first, I thought I was looking at a man, a tall man, hunched over and crawling on all fours in an almost eerie fashion. Then I realized this wasn't a guy. It wasn't anything human. Its body was a pale, ghostly white, and it looked like it hadn't eaten in months, looking thin and almost skeletal. When it moved, it was quick, too quick for a human. It was darting around erratically, making that clicking noise all the while. And as my panicked gaze scanned up, I saw its face. Its eyes were larger than human eyes should be, black and ominous, and there was no nose. An open, gaping mouth looked like a cave in its face, clicking noises coming from it like the casting of dice. Desperately trying to make sense of it all, I stumbled on the porch, dropping my keys again. It seemed to pick up on the sound, and its head spun around faster than anything I'd ever seen. It was then that I saw it was watching me, eyes focused and intense. I would be lying if I said I wasn't terrified. Every instinct was screaming at me to run into the house, but I was frozen on the spot, a deer in the headlights. For what felt like an eternity, I watched it, its black, lifeless eyes watching me right back. Its movements became more agitated, quicker than before. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was ready to pounce, to make me its midnight snack. I don't know what finally broke the spell. Maybe it was just fear winning over curiosity. With a jolt, I turned to unlock the door, my trembling fingers struggling with the keys. With one last panicked look back, I saw the creature had disappeared, leaving behind an empty yard and the fading echo of its strange clicking noise. Throwing myself into the house and slamming the door shut, I took a deep, shaky breath. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of it all, but I couldn't. What was that thing, and what did it want? I never found the answer to that. The next day, I approached the yard, half expecting the creature to be there waiting for me. But there was nothing, no trace of it. But every so often, I still hear that clicking noise at night. Sometimes, I think I see a flash of pale movement in the shadows. I don't venture out to investigate, though. Some things are better left unexplored. That's my story. If anyone else out there has had a similar experience, I hope this helps them feel less alone. Hey Donovan, in the brief downtime we get during deployment, your show has been a much needed distraction. You've been asking for listener experiences, and I think I have a story you might find interesting. This happened during my last tour overseas. It's something I've kept very quiet due to the nature of my work. I'm a Marine, presently stationed halfway across the globe from home. The specific location, I can't say, but it's the kind of place where you learn to expect the unexpected. We had been sent in to handle a situation revolving around some dangerous, high-stakes stuff. I won't bore you with the details of our mission, primarily because I can't. All I can tell you is we needed to operate in a remote part of a dangerous territory far removed from any accommodations or amenities that placate the Western man. I can't embellish the danger and hardships that come with the job. It's all part and parcel of what we sign up for. About two weeks into our deployment, we were en route to a new position. We had a convoy of four vehicles heading through some seriously onerous terrain. Imagine the worst road trip ever. Part bumpy roller coaster ride, part heated duck and cover drill. As we moved closer to our destination, even the normally jovial guys in the squad went quiet. You could cut the tension with a knife. Now Donovan, you need to know that when you're out there, functionally cut off from the real world, and stuck in the middle of nothing and nowhere, stories start floating around to bide time. Stories of ghostly figures standing watch, of strange voices whispering into radios in languages unheard of. 
of pranks that had us pissing our pants in terror. While these stories were entertaining, they were simply ghost stories, and I didn't lend much credence to them, that is, until what happened that night. I was in the third vehicle of our convoy, sitting shotgun next to our driver, Sanchez. He's a stocky guy, always chewing on an unlit cigar, his first form of an inside joke with himself about stereotypes. We were having a frustratingly mundane chat about an Italian pasta recipe his grandmother swore by when something strange happened. The lead vehicle's brake lights flash on and off, halting our ruggedized engines and leaving an unusual stillness. The radio crackled, and the commanding officer from the first vehicle ordered everyone to stay put while they scouted ahead. Something wasn't right, and we all felt it. Sanchez let out a low whistle, muttering a string of curses under his breath. This was supposed to be a routine patrol, the proverbial walk in the park, as Sanchez would have quipped. But that was far from what was shaping up. Ten agonizing minutes of silence followed, before our radio choked back to life. An erratic call to regroup, laced with a barely hidden note of panic. Again, details of our job require me to be discreet, but I can tell you, it's rare to hear that note in the voice of another Marine. We began to proceed forward slowly. In the flickering glow of our vehicle's headlights, the road ahead looked wrong, twisted somehow. Navigating past the first vehicle, we saw that it was off the road, tilted horribly into a ditch. Its remaining cracked headlight casting an ominous glow onto the fractured windshield. I felt a prickle of unease spread over me. The quietness that had descended was so out of place, so unnatural. Something was out there in the inky night, but what? I reached for my service rifle, checking the magazine by habit, my fingers finding cold solace in the familiar texture under them. Then came a low rumbling growl from the tall grass by the road. Something you'd hear from a predator, but much deeper. If fear had a sound, that was it. We braced as something moved, casting a monstrous scaled shadow on the headlight-drenched gravel. And then, all hell broke loose. My skin felt cold, and for the first time, I felt truly isolated and cut off from the world I knew. Then, from the shadows, emerged a figure that looked like it was ripped straight from the covers of science fiction novels. My hand reached instinctively for the dog tag around my neck, perhaps for consolation, assurance, or maybe even divine intervention. The creature standing in the halo of our vehicle's dim headlights was tall, easily seven, maybe even eight feet. It had a nightmare-inducing stare with piercing yellow eyes, the pupils slit-like and predatory, that seemed to evaluate us with an uncanny, chilling intelligence. Shadows danced over it as it moved. It was muscular, humanoid, but everything about it screamed extraterrestrial predator. Its skin reminded me of a snake, scales shimmering even in the dirt cast twilight. Splashes of dirt splotched the creature's hide, but from the look of it, no amount of mud could dampen the fear those fierce eyes inspired. It moved with a graceful, predatory caution that seemed at odds with its gargantuan size. A flash of a dark claw swung by its side, the sharp talons catching the light in a menacing gleam. There I sat, clutching my rifle with a white-knuckled grip. Pulling up every bit of guts I've ever gathered, I opened fire. There wasn't time for discussion or for rational thought. Everything was fight or flight, and in our line of work, flight isn't an option. The subsequent seconds were a ringing blur. I remember the deafening sound of gunfire the chaos of the frightened yells, and then fear turning into disbelief as the creature, unflustered, dodged the bullets. In the blink of an eye, it had disappeared into the wilderness. The aftermath was frantic, a whirlwind of tense faces and nervous chuckles. We found ourselves looking over our shoulders for days after. It was an event that was never spoken of, a secret heavy in the air. Soldiers are trained not to fear the enemy, but what enemy did we face out there? I wish I had answers for you, Donovan. I wish I could tell you that it was just another tall tale from a night out in the field. But every time I run through that memory, I find myself questioning the shadows and listening a little closer for growls in the silent night. The world is so much larger, so much older, and so much more unnerving than we can ever fathom.
Hey there, Donovan. I hope you're doing well. Have been a big fan of your show for quite some time now and thought I'd share an incident that occurred a couple of years back. Still gives me goosebumps whenever I think about it. I'm a police officer and have been on the job for almost a decade. Work in a little town in the heartland of Kentucky. You know, the kind of place where everyone knows each other, where life's unassuming and, for the most part, pretty slow. Sort of like, Friday night high school football is the highlight of our week. Night patrols are my thing. Always have been. There's a certain serenity blanketed in the darkness, minus the occasional drunk on the roadside or a routine domestic disturbance call. But mostly, it's just me in the road. It started off as just another patrol night in fall, the crisp air nipping at any exposed skin and the moon casting long, lonesome shadows on the otherwise smoothly paved back roads. I remember that day, I was driving down this narrow stretch of road, shadowed by a dense cluster of trees on either side. It was late, probably edging closer to midnight. I had turned off my stereo, deciding to just get lost in the ambient sounds of the night. The hum of the car engine, the rustle of leaves, you know, the usual musings of a quiet patrol night. Had me a few nightly passers by, foxes and deer, startle in the glare of the headlights, dart back into the woodland edges. Gave me a fair share of a chuckle or two, watching them bound off into the shadows. Just as I'm easing into the comfortable monotony, a crackling noise came over the radio followed by the dispatcher's voice. Something about checking out a noise complaint up Old Mill Road. It was one of the old timers who lived nearby. Claimed he heard weird sounds from the woods leading off his backyard. Figuring it was probably a wild animal, I nonetheless obliged and made a quick U-turn, making my way to Old Mill. Once, it had been a bustling place with a grain mill and small shopping plaza, catering to the locals. But nowadays, with the population moving towards the newly developed suburbs, Old Mill was practically abandoned, save for a few old buildings and some homes scattered here and there. I pulled up near the caller's address and stepped out. He was pretty shaken up, pointed out towards the dark woods adjoining his property. His usually boisterous hound dog was now a whimpering mess refusing to budge from its kennel. After a quick chat with him, I headed down the trodden path. The woods were eerily quiet, only the wind whispering through the leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. I tread forward, unsure about what I was looking for. It's funny when you think about it, Donovan. I've chased down criminals and stood down guns, but nothing really prepares you for the dread of stepping into a desolate, moody woodland late at night. That's when it began. My radio started acting up all of a sudden. Intermittent buzzes of static and whispery voices saying things I couldn't quite make out. Thought it was a signal issue but it never happened before. As I moved in further, I picked up on something, a peculiar musky scent, somewhat akin to wet soil after a fresh rainfall, except there was this undercurrent of rot, kind of like meat gone bad. This was soon followed by what appeared to be strange shadow movements around the trees, growing more frequent with every step. All the while, the wind seemed to whisper things, soft, almost unintelligible. Could have brushed that off as imagination, but the chill I felt wasn't just from the cold. That's when I saw it, or rather, the them. Glowing pair of eyes up in the trees, an owl, I assumed. But then I saw another, and another, all separate, all unblinking, watching me. Their colors shifting from red to yellow in the narrow beam of my flashlight. Suddenly, there was a rustle and a large crow flew into the light of my torch from nowhere. The absolute size of it was unsettling. Shaking off the initial shock, I walked on, but the feeling of being watched was undeniable. Stronger, even. Every hair on my body was screaming at me to turn back, leave. But cop instincts, they've got you stubborn and sometimes foolhardy. And then it happened. That feeling of something abruptly charging at you, adrenaline coursing through your veins, but your body won't move. Out of the thicket, emerged a figure. A coyote, I supposed, from the poor visibility. But that's where things got weird. It stood on its hind legs, its red glare boring into me. Something no coyote can or should do. As the fear balled up in my throat, I fell back, scrambling to defend myself. Just as I raised my gun, it laughed, 
an eerie hollow sound that resembled a human cackling, and in a flash, dashed off into the woods. No animal I know could do that, and I've seen a fair share of the wildlife around these parts. Left panting and wide-eyed, it took me a moment to gather myself, but the stench and a pending dread were written all over those woods. Clearing the area soon after, I couldn't shake off the encounter for the rest of my shift. Over the next few days, I thought long and hard about reporting it. I mean, who'd believe me? So, I kept it to myself, save for a few close ones. During that time, I researched what it could have been, stumbled upon some unsettling stuff about skinwalkers, and how strikingly similar it was to my incident. Since that night, I don't drive anywhere near Old Mill during my patrols, and whenever I do pass by during the day, there's always this discomfort, like someone, something, watching me from the woods. But at the end of the day, I signed up to protect and serve, to confront fear, and that's what I keep telling myself. Every time fear of that night creeps back in. That's it, Donovan. I hope folks out there listening might have some insight or maybe, just maybe, someone who shared a similar encounter. Thanks if you end up using this on your show. I'm a park ranger at Biscayne National Park and have been for the better part of two decades now. I mostly worked a late shift. I started doing it when my kids were little. It was easier for the wife and me to juggle our schedules as parents. And, I won't lie, there's something peaceful about the park at night. A calm that settles over the land like a misty blanket. This particular night was like any other. It was around mid-July, a few years back during one of those heat waves where the day was sweltering. But the night with the breeze coming off the bay, it was bearable, even pleasant. Rounding up the last of my paperwork, I headed out for my usual patrol. I've always found peace in these quiet hours. It's just me, the moon, and the creatures of the night. People think of nature as something beautiful, and sure it is, with its awe-inspiring sunsets and towering trees. But there's a raw, untamed side of it as well. There are mysteries cloaked in the darkness, and secrets whispered through the rustling leaves. This realization didn't scare me. It fascinated me. Pulling on my jacket, I started up the engine of my old ranger truck, the headlights cutting through the almost solid blackness of the night. The road was familiar, every turn, every bump. Habit guided me through the dense forest that framed the asphalt road. My usual patrol route involved checking the camping sites, the docks, and the picnic areas, ensuring everything was as it should be. But that night, something was different. As I approached the end of the picnic area, the truck's radio crackled into life and a strange interference filled the cabin. You know, the kind you hear when you're trying to tune a radio station, but you just can't get a lock. Just white noise and static. Thinking it was a technical glitch, I smacked the side of the piece, but it continued its crackling. As the static filled the air, my eyes were drawn to the right where the picnic tables were, and that's when I noticed a figure in the distance, barely visible. It was awkwardly silent, despite the noise from my truck radio. The silence of the forest was eerie and almost deafening, like the night was holding its breath. Ignoring the continuous static from the radio, I decided to investigate and turned off the engine. The figure was standing near one of the picnic tables, but too far for me to make out the details. I grabbed a flashlight, and with a deep breath, I slowly climbed out of the safety of my vehicle. My boots crunched on the gravel beneath as I ventured into the night the harsh beam of the handheld light slicing open the darkness. I had a job to do, and that's protecting this park and everyone and everything in it. So I swallowed my hesitation, reminding myself of the duty that came with my badge. My heart pounded in my chest as the flashlight illuminated the area, revealing the mysterious figure more clearly. I figured it was someone trespassing after hours. We got that sometimes and you never know if you are going to run into one of the crazies or not. So yeah, I was nervous, but I didn't expect what happened next. The first thing I noticed about the figure was the size. There was no way this was a person. It was massive, towering over me at a height I could only guess was well over eight feet. The next thing I noticed was the smell, a putrid stench that filled the night air. 
It was a rancid smell, like old wet leaves mixed with an animal scent I couldn't put a name to. Now I've seen many things during my time as a park ranger, from alligators to black bears, but what I saw standing there was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. Its body was robust and powerful, covered in thick dark brown hair that almost looked reddish in the beam of my flashlight. The face, I don't even know how to describe it. It was some sort of cross between man and ape. It had a heavy jaw, a prominent forehead, and deep set, almost human eyes that seemed to glow ominously in the light. It had a flat nose with wide nostrils and a chiseled jawline that was covered in what looked like old scars. For a moment, we just stared at each other, me frozen in place. If Sasquatch was indeed real, I was looking right at it. There seemed to be intelligence behind his nearly human eyes that I found unnerving. Suddenly, it let out a bone-rattling yell so loud that it seemed to echo across the entire park. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I felt a shiver of fear ripple down my spine. The creature turned, its colossal frame moving with surprising grace, and disappeared into the darkness. Shaking, I hurried back to my truck, locking the door behind me. I frantically grabbed the radio, informing the authorities about what I had seen. The feeling of unease stayed with me, my pulse still racing, as I drove away from the site with the image of that creature burned into my memory. As I patrolled the rest of the park, my mind raced, trying to come to terms with what had happened. I had heard stories of Bigfoot sightings before, but had always dismissed them as tall tales. But now, having seen something so incredible and terrifying with my own eyes, I wasn't so quick to dismiss them in the future. Ever since that night, my shifts have taken on a new perspective. I drive down that familiar road, my eyes peering out into the shadows, always wondering if the creature is watching for me as closely as I'm watching for it. The calm thread of the park hasn't changed. It's still peaceful, still beautiful, and still completely unpredictable. So there you have it. My story of the time I had a face-to-face -face encounter with what I believe to be a Sasquatch. It was a night I will never forget, and one that continues to haunt me to this day. I still patrol the same park, drive the same roads, and experience the same peace I always have but now, with an added feeling of trepidation and wonder. I suppose this is what makes these late night patrols worth it. I never know what I'll find in the shadows. I had a strange encounter during one of my camping trips a few years ago, thought it might be worth sharing. This one particular night of stargazing and solitude turned into an experience I've struggled to wrap my mind around ever since. I've always been a sucker for wilderness and solitude, thrived on it even. The adrenaline rush from being in a remote, desolate place, it just rejuvenates me. I guess that's why I took off that weekend in November heading up to the Manistee National Forest in Michigan. All I wanted was to sit by a crackling fire, eat canned beans, and wake up with the brisk morning air in my lungs. Just me in the wilderness. I remember finding this absolutely serene spot by the edge of a dense thicket, right next to the Manistee River. The view itself was enough to make up for the four-hour drive. I spent the afternoon setting up camp, collecting firewood, rigging up my old tent, just immersing myself in the simple labor that wilderness demanded. It was a clear night. You could see every star in the sky. I managed a decent campfire, kept myself warm with an old camping jacket, and survived on canned beans and crackers that I had carried. Beautiful simplicity if you ask me. I zipped up the tent after dousing the fire, and I don't remember how long it took for sleep to wash over me. Probably not too long. The fatigue after a busy day always ensures a good night's sleep. Now, while I love camping and all, you've got to understand, the wilderness can play some weird tricks on you. Your mind suddenly becomes hyper alert about every rustling leaf, every breeze, every solitary hoot in the distance. Usually, I treat it as a part of the adventure. Little did I know that night was going to be wildly different than my usual adventures. Finally nodding off after some tossing and turning, I remember being jerked back to consciousness in the early twilight hours. 
I still had my doubts if it was real or just a dream. There was this guttural noise, not too far from my tent. It was an echoing low moan, a mix of a growl and a guttural grunt. It was a sound I've never heard before, and believe me, I have heard all sorts of animal and bird calls during my camping trips throughout the years. This sound, it felt primeval, ancient even. Now it wasn't too menacing, but definitely put me on edge. Shrugging it off as some forest animal, I told myself I need to get used to it if I wanted to continue camping out so often. I kept lying there, waiting for sleep to claim me again, wondering what could make such a bizarre noise. My mind dared not wander towards thoughts of the unknown. Dozing off, I remembered, I forgot to cover up the rest of the canned beans. Figuring some scavenger had sniffed it out in the middle of the night, I drifted back to an uneasy slumber. Unknown to me, the real surprise awaited when dawn broke. As the first light of dawn crept in, I could hear the chirping of birds outside my tent, their melody strangely comforting after the eerie sounds from the previous night. Still groggy from the unexpected wake-up call, I stepped out of my tent. The morning was beautiful, the mist from the river floating in lazy spirals. As I was working the sleep out of my eyes, something caught my attention. There were these massive footprints circling around my campsite. They were easily about 16, 17 inches long and much wider than any human foot. The shape was hard to define in the morning light, but they had deep imprints. The creature who made them was heavy. The shape appeared human. There seemed to be the outline of toes. That sight, it rooted me to the spot, the echo of that sound from the night ringing again in my ears. Feeling a shiver, I approached the remains of last night's fire. Half the logs knocked over, my forgotten bean can crushed as if run over by a truck. The grunts from the night, the footprints. I tried reconciling it with a bear, maybe. But deep within, I knew this was unlike any bear behavior I've heard of. A dread was sinking in, almost choking me with nerves. With heart pounding in my chest, I decided I couldn't stay. As much as I loved the call of the wild, this was just too much. Made my blood run cold. Hastily wrapping up my camping gear, I left that can of beans there. A quiet marker of a night I couldn't forget, even if I tried. I wasn't sure what had visited my campsite that night. On my drive home, my mind wrestled with questions I didn't have answers to. Was it a bear? Did the darkness and my imagination turn a simple scavenger into something more ominous? Or was there really something out there, lurking in the thickets of Manistee Forest? The footprints, the dreadful sounds that had punctuated the stillness, the shattered remnants of my campsite, all of it felt so real, so tangible, and yet unbelievable. I think I know what made those prints, but I'm almost afraid to admit it to myself. The mystery of those colossal footprints and uncanny sounds didn't keep me away from the wilderness. But every so often on a solitary camping night, around the glow of the campfire, I find my mind drifting back to that November morning in Manistee Forest, filled with an unnerving mix of apprehension and intrigue. It happened about a couple of years back on a job I was assigned to. I'm a plumber by trade. I've seen my fair share of unpleasant sights, but this, well, this was something else. I was working in a busy neighborhood, an old industrial district that turned into a hot residential spot. Plenty of fixer-uppers there. One early morning, on a trip for a routine job, I had the most otherworldly encounter. Every morning, I wake up even before the birds start chirping and dawn breaks. I've always been an early riser. It was something about the tranquility of the morning air and the calm before everyone else starts their day. You see, plumbing isn't normally looked at as an exciting job, but it's always kept me on my toes. I enjoy it well enough. So back to that day, I had a job at a former warehouse that had been converted into swanky apartments. The job was simple enough. Unblock a drainage pipe in the basement. I'd been there before, and I remember the place had a kind of eerie quiet about it. But that day, as I descended into the basement, the usual hum of the boilers and the distant rush of water seemed subdued, almost muted. My flashlight cast long, eerie shadows in the darkness, but I've been in enough dim basements to not let that bother me. 
Finding my way to the clogged pipe, my nostrils filled with a familiar smell, the damp, slightly rotten scent you'd expect when you're dealing with stagnant water. But there was something else, a lingering raw smell that I could not quite place. And then I heard it, a low, consistent tap-tap-tapping echoing from deeper in the basement. I thought it might have been a water pipe banging against the wall, or a faulty water heater, but it wasn't the typical clunking you'd expect. So I decided to go and check it out. The darkness seemed thicker as I moved further from the glow of my flashlight that was still at my workstation. Then, for just a split second, my flashlight beam illuminated something unusual in the dark. It was fast, so fast that I barely had a chance to even realize that there was something there at all. It wasn't a rat, too big for that, nor a human. It was pale, almost ghastly so, and was moving on all fours. I could not make out anything else before it skittered back into the darkness. My heart pounded in my chest and a sudden chill ran down my spine. The strange smell seemed to grow stronger now, making me feel a bit nauseous. As I tried to process what I had just seen and what I was supposed to do next, a low clicking sound filled the air bouncing off the raw concrete walls. It was like twigs snapping or clattering rocks, but there was an erratic, almost organic rhythm to it. The sound was both curious and frightening, and with it came that strange smell again, raw, musty, and metallic. With a deep breath, I called out, trying to manage a firm tone. There was no response, just a short pause in the clicking, which then resumed. I was contemplating whether to head upstairs and call the building security when I saw it again. My light tracing along the rough concrete floors and wet walls picked up the figure swiftly moving again. This time, I had a better look. It was a nauseating sight, like something out of a horror movie. This thing was about four, maybe five feet long, pale and gaunt, but with an unnerving agility. It had an almost deformed human-like appearance, but the limbs were all wrong. The hands and feet, contorted and elongated, seemed purposely designed for crawling instead of standing. The soft light caught its face in such a way that only emphasized the black pits that could only be eyes and a large gaping mouth, devoid of any teeth or tongue. For a split second, our eyes met. Those large, empty black eyes bore into me. It felt as if this creature, this crawly thing, was as confused and terrified of me as I was of it. It didn't expect to find me down there, just as I had not expected to find it. This wasn't just some mindless anomaly of nature. It felt like it had consciousness. I have to admit, fear got to me. I'd be lying if I said I didn't turn tail and bolt. I picked up my tools and got out of there as fast as I could, all the while hearing that clicking sound getting louder and more frantic. Security was called. They acted like they took me seriously, but the look in their eyes said it all. No one checked the basement as far as I know, not immediately at least. The job was still unfinished, but I didn't care. I never returned to that job site. I heard from a fellow plumber later that it was concluded to be a large rat infestation. This was easier for everyone's understanding, I guess. However, the episode left me rattled. For weeks after the encounter, I had nightmares about those large black eyes, the clicking noises echoing in my ears. To this day, I still wonder what it was doing there. Did it get lost? Did it live down there? What scares me more is the realization that there is so much unexplained in our daily lives. As ordinary as we like to keep things, one can't help but sense the extraordinary lurking just around the corner. I want to thank you for giving me a platform to share this story. People need to realize not all strange encounters can be so easily dismissed. I have a pretty strange story to share. I'm not usually one for these types of tales, but this one is real and it rattled me up good. A few springs back, I was out here on the farm, just outside of Raymond, a little old town in the Midwest. Now I'm a simple man, a farmer and I've got this precious piece of land that's been in my family for generations. My day-to-day -day life isn't all that exciting, not that I'm complaining. There's a certain peace to be found in the routine. Up before dawn, chores all day. In by sundown, rinse and repeat. 
That day was just like any other. I checked on the livestock, mended a part of the fence that had seen better days, and spent the better part of the morning tending to the fields, planning, plowing, planting. That's my life when the growing season comes. And you know what they say, the secret to a good harvest is starting early. Every day, I stroll through each field before dawn, coffee in hand, taking in the crisp morning air and preparing myself for another day of hard work. There's this brief moment, just as the sun starts to peek over the horizon, where everything feels peaceful and still. It's at moments like these that I really appreciate how much I love this land. It's hard work, sure, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. About mid-morning, I found myself out near the old oak tree, the massive one that stood at the edge of our property for as long as anyone can remember. I had my earphones in, a bit of Johnny Cash to keep me company, and I was all set to start spreading the last of the mulch around the foot of the tree. The sun was high in the sky by then, casting long, sprawling shadows. It was just like any other day, but something felt off. You know that prickling sensation you get when you feel like you're being watched? Couldn't shake that. I've spent my life learning the rhythms of the land, the ebb and flow of the seasons, the songs the birds sing at different times of day, the way the shadows stretch across the fields as the sun travels across the sky. You learn these things and you start to feel a connection to the place. You start to sense when things are as they should be and when they're not. But. Even to my own surprise, I shrugged off that feeling and got back to work. I'd kept on with my work and all but forgotten about that strange sensation. With Ring of Fire playing to my rhythmic shoveling, all was right with the world again. Now, here's where things start to get mighty strange. As I was wrapping up my work around lunchtime, I noticed something out of the ordinary in the far off wheat field. There were markings of some sort that hadn't been there just the day before. Squinting against the sun, I couldn't quite make out the details. Real peculiar. Seeing those unexpected changes in my well-tended plot. So I decided to go take a closer look. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like those stories you'd heard of crop circles over in Britain. But this was in my little corner of the Midwest. Sound as mad as a hatter, I know. But there it was. Plain as day. The markings were intricate almost akin to some sort of extraterrestrial blueprint, spirals extending from a central point forming a complex pattern that looked like something da Vinci might have dreamt up. Each twist and turn was cut into the wheat perfectly. There was not a stalk out of place. And the sheer scale of it, it was covering a patch the size of a football field, possibly bigger. I was so engrossed stepping gingerly along the edge of the formation, taking in the otherworldly artistry of whatever this was. Time somehow seemed to distort, each minute stretching out longer than the last. I could hardly hear much over the beating of my heart. By the time I snapped back, I noticed the sun was already beginning to dip near the horizon. I couldn't wrap my head around how long I'd been out there. A sense of cold dread washed over me, and I realized I had to get out of that field and back to the farmhouse. It's a funny thing what happens when you get rattled. You try and put it all out of your mind focus on the simple things that need to get done. Feed the livestock, mend the fences, and weed the fields, hoping normal bleeds back into life. But even as I tried to keep to my routine, I couldn't shake off that uncanny feeling. Every so often, I'd catch myself looking back out towards the fields, skin crawling with tingles. Over the next few days, that carved out piece of the field became the elephant in my living room. I thought about roping off the area and calling in the experts, but stories of supposed UFO sightings and conspiracies about men in black swirled in my head. Unable to explain it, I'm now left with nothing but curiosity and unease. An ominous sign unveiled in the lush wheat fields, marking out a message I couldn't decipher, marring the quiet idol of my farm. Each day it sits there as a reminder of something unknowable unnatural out there in the world. Now every sundown fills me less with peace and a sense of dread creeps in. I'm left grappling, hoping for an answer, some semblance of sanity in all this. But for now, the markings remain, a cryptic message from another realm. I'm not sure what's out there. Thinking about it makes the hair at the back of my neck stand up and takes the good night's sleep right away. 
Whatever its purpose, it was my proof that something more is out there. I remember this like it was yesterday, but then again it wasn't something you would easily forget. The four of us, all childhood friends, had a sort of camping tradition among us. It was me, Kurt, Danny, and Bill. We'd grown up together, but life took us on different paths like it often does. However, we always made sure to reconnect through a yearly camping trip. This particular year, we had gotten a late start. It was around noon, and we found ourselves on the path to Piney Hollows, the picturesque forest spot nestled against the Greenbrier River. It was just a couple of hours outside of Springfield, Illinois. Piney Hollows was one of my favorite places in the world. It was a smattering of oaks, pines, and maples spread as far as the eye could see. It was as tranquil as it could get. No murmurs of city noises, just the steady rhythm of nature. We managed to find a suitable camp spot near the river, where the ground was even, and the trees provided decent cover. While Kurt and Bill wrestled with the tents, Danny and I set off to gather firewood. The job was quick and easy, and so, with an armful of branches, we circled back to our base where the tents were just about set up. Although we all hurled a few insults at each other about how slow the others had been, but it was all just in fun as we were just boys being boys. As the evening settled in, shadows began skirting around the edges of our tents. Marshmallows were roasted above the fire and beers were passed around, and the story sharing kicked off. Some stories were hilarious, some nostalgic, some just downright impossible. The night stretched on as we sat there laughing and talking. Now before I share what happened next, it might be worth recalling that Piney Hollows is known for its tranquility. It's one of those places where you could meditate to the chirping of birds and the whispering of the wind. Not once did we expect, let alone prepare for, what we were about to experience. After all, we were there to enjoy nature, share some laughs, and enjoy each other's company. Underneath the dim light of the camping lanterns, the woods seemed to take on a different hue. What was green and friendly during the day started to appear dark and shadowy. It was well past midnight, and we were still up, talking and joking by the dying fire. Suddenly, out of nowhere was an echoing call. It was a sound none of us recognized, a low-pitched reverberation that seemed to shiver out from the deepest corners of the forest echoing off the trees surrounding us. It was impossible to pinpoint its location. It wasn't a bird, not any we knew of, and it wasn't the friendly chatter of a fox or the telltale growl of a bear. It was something else. That sound that planted a seed of unease in each of us. I could see it in their faces. The confusion, the surprise, the subtle fear mirrored in my own thoughts. But there we were, four childhood friends, in the middle of our camping ground, not knowing the sheer terror awaiting us as the night progressed. We should have left right then, but following the straying sound back to its origin seemed like a good idea at the time. Maybe it was the alcohol, or our collective curiosity, or just plain recklessness, but we decided to seek out whatever was making that noise. We didn't doubt our intuitions. After all, we'd stomped around these woods as kids and knew every creature that trotted, crawled, or flew around venturing deeper into the heart of the forest. Our steps, drunken whispers, and the rustling of the leaves were the only sounds heard against the still night. Our flashlight swept across the underbrush. The call echoed again, closer this time, a guttural sound that sent shivers spiraling down my spine. It wasn't just fear, it was a sort of primal terror, something you'd feel when you know you're being preyed upon. It happened in the blink of an eye, Unearthly yellow eyes emerged from the darkness. We had found the creature we were looking for. It was grotesque in a way I don't know how to describe. It stood on its hind legs like a human, in a way, but it was anything but. It was some sort of giant lizard, about nine feet tall, with bright yellow eyes. It had the torso similar to a man's, but its face, its damn face, held the terror of a dinosaur or maybe just a freakishly mutant lizard. Maybe it was the shock, or the booze, or the unbearable terror. But we stood frozen in place, staring at those eyes. The reptilian figure quietly watched us, 
its gaze shifting from one terrified human to the next, its muzzle pulled back in a grin, revealing row upon row of sharp teeth, and then it lunged. In that split second, we became four panicked boys again. Kurt on the lead, we bolted back towards the campsite, every rustle behind us amplifying our terror. Without a moment's delay, we scrambled into our vehicles, hearts thundering against our ribs, our breaths heavy, and our minds spinning. As we drove off, leaving our equipment behind, I glanced back one last time to catch a glimpse of those glow-in-the-dark eyes in the rearview mirror. Once we reached the realm of civilization, where the city lights were comforting and the streets were familiar, we stopped. Silence hovered over us, as if words had lost their meaning. We looked at each other, acknowledging the disbelief etched on our faces. What had we just encountered? Was it real? A creature from a myth? A figment of our drunken imaginations? But one thing was undeniable. We'd walked in the woods as men on a getaway, on a mission to revisit our childhood adventures, and we walked out the very same woods, with a newfound terror in our lives, a kindred memory unlike any other we'd shared before. So there you have it. That's our story. None of us have entered a forest since. None of us have left the city. Call it PTSD, if you will. We've just given up trying to convince ourselves it was an animal. The image of that creature remains seared into our memories, and the primal fear still haunts our dreams till date. Since then, we took to a new tradition, reunion barbex in the safety of our backyards, reminiscing our trials, errors, and the sheer terror that Piney Hollows gifted us. A few years back, I embarked on an epic mountaineering journey in the heart of Washington, deep in the Cascades. Out there, I had an encounter with something unexplainable. I consider myself a good mountaineer, the thrill of ascending to great heights, the companionship of the crisp, high-altitude air, and of course, the phenomenal view. It's a cocktail that rivals any other high I've known. Call me crazy, but there's something electrifying about testing your endurance and embracing Mother Nature in such a raw capacity. The most alluring part of it all to me has always been the feeling of standing on top of the world, looking down at creation sprawled out beneath your feet. On this particular venture, my attention had been captivated by a notable peak in the distance. Maybe I was enticed by its dominating presence or the sheer scale of the challenge it represented. Who knows? All I knew at that moment was that I had to conquer it. The ascent started out as usual, the crunch of gravel under my sturdy boots, the fresh scent of dewy vegetation, and the vibrant palette of nature's colors against the backdrop of a clear blue sky. What was different this time, though, was a strange, inexplicable feeling I had, a sensation I brushed aside as the thrill of a forthcoming adventure. I was about halfway up the mountain, my muscles straining in protest from the constant push and pull against gravity. Nonetheless, each challenging footfall only added to the overbearing sense of accomplishment. To the uninitiated, it might seem like an awfully grueling way of having fun, but for me, this was my kind of playground. Some of the cliff faces I had to navigate were precariously positioned, and the paths that snaked their way up the mountain were nothing more than narrow goat trails. My fingers ached from the cold, my back protested under the weight of my pack, but dang it if I wasn't having a blast. There was a particular stretch along the side of the mountain where I spent a considerable amount of time. There had been a series of minor setbacks, chunks of rocky terrain giving way under my boots and dwindling water supplies. It was a steeper climb than I'd anticipated. None of these frustrations mattered though, not when you were playing in the grand arena of nature. Now, let me tell you this, as any experienced mountaineer would infer, Mountain folks have stories. You hear whispers from the seasoned locals up in these parts about things that lurk in the wilderness, tales that tend to border on the fringe of reality. You don't pay much mind to them because mountains themselves are like an epic tale. They have their fair share of myths and legends surrounding them. Initially, I'd laugh the stories off as not much more than hearsay. Little did I know, things were about to take a distinctly weird detour. As I rounded a sharp bend, 
I caught sight of the crown poking up through another set of peaks. I stopped in my tracks, a sense of awe washing over me. As I reveled in the sight, something peculiar on a distant peak caught my eye. It was a silhouette too oddly formed to be a human, and substantially larger than anything else in my line of sight. I raised my binoculars, biting my lip in anticipation. As the silhouette came into focus, my breath hitched in my throat. There, standing a significant distance away on a neighboring peak, was this colossal figure with a striking height of maybe eight or nine feet tall if I had to judge from the landscape around it. From this distance, it was tough to make out the facial details, but the glint of reddish-brown hair all over its body was unmistakable. As the rays of the sun dimmed, my view of the figure grew murkier and the details blurrier. It let out a deep howl. I don't know why, possibly in frustration or a hollow call to its kin. It echoed down the valley. The sound of the creature was so powerful, it triggered a small avalanche in a far-off mountain face. Suddenly, a gusty, harsh wind whipped up, blowing icy spindles into my face, causing me to adjust my stance and, unavoidably, lose sight of the creature for a moment. An uncomfortable chill ran down my spine, not because of the cold wind, but the realization that I was in the wild, surrounded by unpredictable elements of nature where anything, however unimaginable, was plausible. When I found my footing and adjusted my grip on the binoculars, I scanned the entirety of that peak again, but the figure was nowhere to be found. The silhouette vanished as mysteriously as it had appeared. This left me shocked and freezing in the biting wind, on a rock halfway to the world's ceiling. In the chilly evening, having negotiated successfully with gravity to steer clear of a tumble down the jagged cliff, I found my way back to the base. The crackling campfire beckoned against the darkness of the mountain range and the eeriness of my encounter. Since that day, I've often found myself reflecting on what I had witnessed. A part of me questioned whether it was merely the play of light and shadows against the imposing backdrop of the mountain. Yet the howl, the silhouette, the imposing stature, deep-set eyes, and the gobsmacking disappearance are far too detailed to shake off as a mere trick of the light. Sharing this with others never felt like an option. Since then, every wait for dawn and every returned gaze at the forbidden peaks has been laced with a renewed sense of curiosity and a shudder of fear. After all, mountains have always been rich with myths and legends. Who knows what could be lurking, waiting, and watching in those far-off, untamed wildernesses? From the onset, I really loved Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. I began my park ranger service there in the spring of 2018. Picture vast green meadows, densely wooded forests, and the sweeping faces of grizzled cliffs. It was the kind of place that had an allure of mystery and wonder that always made me feel like I was living in one of those historical novels I'd spend hours reading when I wasn't on patrol. Being a park ranger, there was more than just a job to me. It was a passion that stemmed from an intense love for nature. I've always loved the wilderness, camping and trekking through national parks since my childhood days. I always figured caretaking for one would be the best way to preserve the kind of places I'd spend my autumns, springs and summers exploring. On that particular day in early November, it was mild and calm. The sun was just starting to set, which painted the sky in striking hues of orange and pink. It was one of those scenes which, if you didn't pause to admire, you'd regret missing. My usual routine revolved around patrolling the trails, helping out tourists with directions, and on rare occasions dealing with any disturbances. Beyond that, a significant part of my duties lay in conserving the flora and fauna of the park. That day, my plan was to pay a visit to an area that had been reported for some possible weather erosion. As the evening grew darker, I hopped in my trusty old Ford Ranger, set the radio to the nearest weather station, and set off on the winding dirt road towards the site. It was a pretty typical night. The park, generally quiet, was not showing any signs of troubling activity. The tourists had gradually thinned out as darkness fell, leaving the park almost eerily silent. 
All you could really hear was the occasional croaking of a night frog or the rustle of small nocturnal critters in the underbrush. As I drove deeper into the park, the gravel crunching under the tires of my truck, I couldn't help but get absorbed in my own thoughts. Little did I know then that tranquility was about to take a chilling turn. Suddenly, the familiar sound of the dirt crunching under the tread of my truck was replaced with an odd, softer, squelching noise. I brought the pickup to a halt and grabbed my flashlight, stepping out onto the road to take a look at what I'd just driven through. The smooth wash of my headlights barely reached the edge of the road, but with the added spotlight from my flashlight, I saw a series of huge footprints matted deeply into the dirt. Something big had lumbered through here recently, and I'd driven over its tracks, leaving an ugly skid right through the middle. I evaluated the depth and size of the prints in the dim light, figuring maybe a bear had wandered too close to the tourist paths. Just as I was about to return to the cab, something caught my ear. An almost human-like grunt echoed across the trees, drowning out the nocturnal symphony around me. It was then that the hairs at the back of my neck stiffened. That was no bear sound. I radioed in, my thumb pressing hard against the talk button as if it could keep my heart from pounding its way out of my chest. Stashing the radio back onto my belt, I thought it best to try to identify the source of the noise. I felt this primal fear creeping its way up my spine, but as a ranger, I knew I had a responsibility to investigate, especially if this thing was potentially a threat to any late night wanderers. The echo had come from the direction of Spruce Tree House, one of the historical landmarks of the park. As I cautiously made my way down the trail, the smell hit me. It started as just a hint of something stale, moldy almost, and evolved into a putrid odor that wrought images of rot and decay. The beam of my flashlight illuminated the narrow trail and stopped at the base of a colossal, hulking figure that turned and glanced back curiously. The light caught on the glossy brownish-red fur of the creature and drew a giant outline against the darkness. Paralyzed with awe and fear, I caught my breath, the beam flickering across a face that held more expression and humanoid features than any animal I've encountered. Set deep inside its large head were dark piercing eyes, a prominent heavy jaw, and chiseled cheekbones that were covered in that hair. The creature was massive, easily over eight feet tall with a bulk that suggested immense strength. My mind wrestled with primal fear and dumbfounded awe. Part of me screamed to run, to retreat and call for backup. The other half wrestled with the acknowledgement of coming across such a rare entity. This was a Sasquatch, I knew that much. With a loud, guttural growl, the creature turned toward me. I think it wanted me to leave. That was a notion I had no trouble accepting. Adrenaline took over then, and I turned on my heel, sprinting towards the direction of my truck. What occurred next, I could barely remember. It was a blur. The dash back felt like minutes instead of seconds. Through it all, I felt oddly grateful. My knowledge of the park and the survival skills it had conditioned me with had been a saving grace. When daylight greeted Mesa Verde, I was back at the ranger station, silent in my relief, reflection, and utter exhaustion. The park had changed overnight for me. The place I had admired for its serene environment was now tinged with a sense of fear and the unnatural. But was it unnatural? Or merely, I had stumbled upon a truth that was hidden within the woods. I now knew that even amidst the calm meadows and cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde, unseen mysteries roamed. And it is these encounters that reminded us, humans, of what a small place we occupy among the vast wilderness. I've been a park ranger at the First Landing State Park in Virginia for the better part of a decade now. I've got my routine down pat. Show up right at dawn, do a quick check-in at the office, grab my gear, and head out on patrol. It's quiet, serene work. I get to watch the world wake up. Wildlife here is pretty usual. We have deer, foxes, even the odd bobcat, and of course a whole lot of waterfowl. But, well, that one particular day. Now, that was different. I was out on one of my regular morning patrols, lacing up my boots and getting started 
just as the sun was beginning to break the horizon. I just finished a run through the campground making sure no fires were left burning, no trash left out to attract the bears, the usual stuff. I was heading back toward the main trail, thinking about getting a cup of coffee to help shake off the morning chill, when I heard this sound. It wasn't like anything I'd ever heard before. It was a sort of hiss, or maybe a whisper, mixed with the rustle of leaves and a faint, distant echo. It sent a chill down my spine, strange enough that I remember frowning, wondering if there was a rogue piece of machinery left out or something, even though all of our equipment was safely stowed away. There was nothing unusual to see, though, just your typical early morning mist rolling off the river nearby. But the sound persisted, soft and eerie. Keep in mind the wildest encounters I usually face involve some overly excited park tourist hand-feeding the wildlife, or a child losing their baseball in a thicket. Suddenly, the trees around me began to sway, rustling as if a stiff wind was blowing through them. But there wasn't any wind. I looked around and just on the edge of my vision, I thought I saw something, a sort of shimmer in the air, like heat rising off the pavement on a hot summer day. That's the best way I can describe it. But it was barely dawn and still quite cool out. Walking towards the shimmer, I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. I've experienced bizarre things in the park before, but nothing quite like this. It gave me a visceral sense of unease, a dread that twisted my stomach. It felt wrong, unnatural even. As I got closer, I was hit with a sudden, intense cold. I mean, it was near freezing, if not lower. I could see my breath in front of me. Still, I was determined to figure out what was going on. I'm not the type to run headlong into trouble, but I'd be lying if I said my curiosity wasn't piqued. Irrespective of anything else that happened that day, I truly felt like I wasn't alone out there. Everything in me was screaming to get out of there, but there was also this strange allure, a magnetic pull that was both intriguing and terrifying. I'd always been the type to walk away from danger, but some part of me wanted to know more to find out the source of that noise, that strange cold, and to see if either of them were connected to that thing. So I pressed on, shivering and wishing for that cup of coffee now more than ever. Just as I was considering turning back, I spotted it through the mist. I saw this shimmering form again. It was a figure of some sort, but it sure as hell wasn't an animal. That I'm sure of. It was transparent, almost like thick fog shaped like a person standing at the edge of the woods. But the weirdest part was the eyes. Whatever this thing was, it had eyes glowing faintly like twin lanterns from underneath a veil of mist. I'm no believer in the supernatural and I've experienced enough strange things in the wild to know that it's easy to mistake harmless natural phenomenon for something more sinister. But I swear that thing looked right at me. I've never been more certain about anything in my life. It was there one moment and gone the next like it was swallowed up by the mist. Even after it vanished, that haunting whispering sound and the bone-deep chill didn't abate. It was as if the forest itself held its breath. For a moment, I was frozen to that spot. Panic edged its way up my spine and lodged itself firmly in my brain. Then, reviving my ranger training, I collected my wits about myself and backed out without turning around. That ghostly figure might have disappeared but I sure wasn't about to find out whether or not it would return. When I was far enough away from the spot, I finally dared to break into a jog, then a sprint, racing back towards the ranger station. I've seen many strange things in the wild, but nothing that unsettled me in quite the same way. Nobody believed me. I've been asked if it was some kind of prank, or if I'd perhaps ingested a substance. I hadn't. Later, I'd go back there in broad daylight, of course if only to confirm to myself that I hadn't been dreaming. Not a single trace was left of my encounter. No signs of disturbance in the grass. No weird temperatures. Nothing. Whatever it was, it was gone now. Even now, I often find myself questioning what I saw and what I believed. Was it my imagination playing tricks? Was it a trick of the light? Or, if that figure was real, what exactly was it? Was it dangerous or just passing through? At the end of it all, though, I've had to accept that I'll probably never get an answer to these questions. And honestly, I'm not sure I want them anymore. 
All I know is that since that day, patrolling the state park has felt a little less ordinary, a little less mundane. The barrier between the known and unknown, somehow, that day, felt paper thin. And me? I'm left straddling between them, the skeptic and the believer, forever changed by a foggy morning in the woods. I wouldn't wish this hanging mystery on my worst enemy. I worked for a while in Kings Canyon National Park, and boy, do I have a story for you. Most people don't realize just how vast the park is, or even how wild and isolated it feels when you're on patrol at night. I'll be honest, it's that tranquil solitude that drew me to this job. When you're out here among the towering granite cliffs, the ancient sequoias, and the wild rivers, well, it reminds you of how small and fleeting our human worries are. Unfortunately, that peacefulness that I so often enjoyed in this place was about to be disrupted by an encounter that left me with more questions than answers. I was on my rounds. It wasn't too exciting. I was tasked with making sure that camping restrictions were respected, checking to ensure there were no adverse encounters with the local wildlife, and most importantly, keeping an eye out for lost tourists who might have wandered off track. That happens more often than it should. I'd been a park ranger for about a decade by then. I thought I had seen everything, but never once had I experienced anything that falls into the unidentified creature category. But as I was saying, I was driving my pickup along the park roads, occasionally shining my powerful spotlight on the dense trees to catch the ethereal glow of a deer's eyes or to spot a mischievous bear foraging in the undergrowth. Oh, the number of times I've had to shoo those brutes away from the campsites because of people leaving food out. It was ridiculous. As I was headed towards the Cedar Grove area, something unusual caught my attention. My radio had started to crackle with static. Now normally this wouldn't be completely out of the ordinary. After all, we're in the mountains, reception can be spotty. But this was different. There was a hum, a quiet, low-pitched sound that somehow managed to echo even in my truck's cabin, almost like the sound you'd imagine a massive transformer would make. I initially brushed it off, assuming some kind of interference, but as I continued patrolling, I got this eerie sensation. You know that prickling you get at the back of your neck when you feel like you're being watched? That's exactly what it felt like. The trees seemed unusually quiet. Even the usually talkative forest night critters were noticeably silent. The only sound accompanying me was the humming static from my radio. I pulled my truck over for a moment, killed the engine, and just listened. A momentary gust of wind rustled through the leaves nearby, but other than that, the silence was stifling. I felt the hair on my arm stand on end, and that's when I saw it. It was a flicker of light within the trees. There was something odd about that light. It wasn't the warm yellow of a camper's fire or the bright beams of headlights or a flashlight. It was a cold, luminous blue, odd and completely out of place in our earthly woodlands. The hues shifted and twisted in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was as if I was looking directly at a bright star, but it was right there, in the middle of the park, and heavily shrouded by the sequoias. Intrigued, or maybe it was my ranger sense of responsibility kicking in, I decided to investigate. After all, Mysterious light sources in a national park aren't really within our recommended list of recreational activities. Leaving my truck behind with my radio attempting to break through the relentless hum, I ventured towards the mesmerizing light. As soon as I moved beyond the clearing, the glow got brighter, illuminating the foliage around me. It was like something straight out of a Spielberg movie. My eyes naturally squinted in response trying to make out the source while also avoiding the blinding glow. The eerie hum got louder each step I took. Then, above me it hovered, a stretch of gray looming overhead, shimmering with bands of strange, oscillating light. It had to have been at least 30 feet wide, maybe more. There were no definitive corners or edges. I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. It just seemed to glide seamlessly into the air, like a piece of polished silver under the moonlight. Not a damn sound, too, other than that overwhelming hum, which seemed like it was resonating from deep within me at this point. I stood there, 
Too dumbfounded to be afraid. Sort of numb, really. I faced down a few angry bears in my time, and the anxiety I felt then was nowhere near the sensation coursing through my veins now. It was otherworldly. Literally. In my trepidation, I managed to back out of the clearing, keeping my eyes on the object. It was static, like it had somehow halted the very concept of time in its vicinity. Then, as soon as I veered into denser forest, it took off, leaving behind not a trace. I didn't know whether it was safer to stay hidden or dash to my truck. This wasn't something we were trained to handle in the park services. This was so far beyond my understanding or control. After what felt like an eternity, the hum finally faded from my ears, and I dared to peek out behind the foliage. There was nothing, just the serenity of King's Canyon at night. It was as though the whole encounter had never happened. I took a few deep breaths, gathered my courage once more, and sprinted for the truck. I didn't breathe easy until I was safely back at the station. I spent the rest of my shift in a daze, huddled by the radio, trying to piece together what had happened to me. It's not something I'd talked about, not until now. People fear ridicule and people fear the unknown. And what I encountered that night was a combination of both. Some days I feel like I'd stumbled into an X-Files episode. Other days I try to find logical explanations. Maybe a military craft I wasn't supposed to see, or the auroras playing tricks on my senses. But I've never really been able to convince myself. I know what I saw and heard, and although it churns my gut every time I recall those moments, I'm also oddly fascinated by them. I don't view the wilderness the same way anymore. It's not just the silence of the park or its towering sequoias that whisper ancient tales anymore. There's something else out there, too. It was the height of summer, 2017, and I was baking away under the unforgiving Texas sun. I was stationed as a park ranger at Palo Duro Canyon State Park. It was a job that usually meant spending most of my time rescuing wayward campers or cleaning up after over-enthusiastic junior scouts. I remember that day well, mainly because of Jimmy. He was Billy's kid from the supply tent, and he'd managed to get a family of raccoons stuck in the waste bin again. As the squeals echoed through the canyon, I laughed. What an absurd situation, and it wasn't the first time it had happened. Life was regular kinds of odd and untreated sunburn out here. So when the first reports came whispering in, speaking of a strange creature in the locality, I didn't take it too seriously. It was probably another case of overreacting tourists taking a coyote for a grizzly, or a stray dog for a wolf. You'd be surprised at how imagination flares in the wilderness. However, as a park ranger, it was my duty to investigate, regardless of my personal skepticism. Plus, it promised a break from Jimmy's shenanigans. The rest of the day passed in a blur of typical ranger duties, monitoring fire conditions, maintaining hiking trails, giving directions to lost tourists. It was the banality of my routine. As evening descended and the Texas sky was set ablaze with hues of red and orange, my radio crackled with the code 34A, a signal used for unregistered animals or unidentified species. A couple camping near Hackberry Camp Area had reported a weird creature lurking about their site. Steering my ranger truck towards the location, my mind raced with possibilities. Could it be a panther, a bear, or perhaps a bobcat? Odd, I reckoned, considering the location wasn't particularly notorious for such disturbances. But working in the great outdoors teaches you to never say never. The dusk was settling into darkness as I pulled up near Hackberry. Armed with just a flashlight and years of ranger experience, the discreet sounds of wildlife were my questionable comfort. From a whining insect chorus to the occasional rustle or distant hoot, the night was a symphony of unseen happenings. Eerily, however, what first caught my attention wasn't the sight of anything out of the ordinary, but rather a smell. Fouler than anything I'd come across during my years of service, it was a concoction of rotten meat and wet dog. Add to that hints of burnt rubber, which seemed out of place in the heart of the wilderness. The stench was pervasive, seeming to seep into the very ground beneath my boots 
and claw its way up into the pre-dawn chill. As I explored deeper into the forest, a low growl echoed from the direction of a grove of Joshua trees, giving me pause. It was deep and resonating, far from the sounds commonplace in these wild lands. I found myself feeling as though I was entering uncharted territory, the atmosphere tangibly shifting into something more ominous. As I trudged forward, breaking through the undergrowth, I noticed peculiar signs, boot-like paw prints unusually large for a native creature, and broken twigs hanging from branches too high up to be the work of small critters, signaling the presence of something substantial. The growling intensified as I neared a large, gnarled tree, whose shadow stood rippling under my flashlight. By now, my ranger bravado had worn thin, replaced by a primal sense of self-preservation. I should have walked away, but years of ingrained curiosity took the better of me. I inched closer, mentally kicking myself for not having my service pistol at hand. Angling my flashlight towards the rugged bark, my beam unveiled a creature that defied belief. Towering over me, it must have been about seven feet tall. It was the size of a grizzly, but with an outline eerily similar to a man's. Its body, muscular and hunched, was hidden under a layer of dark, coarse fur. Its beastly stature was intensified by powerful thighs, broad shoulders, and unusually long, jagged claws glinting ominously in my flashlight's glow. Its face, a haunting meld of canine and human, bore a pronounced brow ridge, a scarred snout, coarse whiskers, and furrowed brows over deep-set glowing yellow eyes. It's as if it was somehow both man and animal. Its gaze held mine, a raw mix of curiosity and animalistic warning. The sheer bizarreness of the creature sent my mind into a whirl, teetering on the edge of fear and fascination. As its guttural growl cut through the silence yet again, the reality pierced through. I was standing inches away from the mythical dogman of Texas lore. Paralyzed by the bizarre standoff, I don't remember how long we stood there locked in that gaze but the spell ultimately shattered with the creature's unsettling howl. It was a drawn-out, echoing roar, resonating with an animalistic fervor that sent a chill down my spine. The creature then turned and vanished into the trees, dislodging rocks and foliage in its hurry. With its departure, an uncanny silence took hold of the area, punctuated only by my labored breathing. Swallowed by the night, the terror of the encounter gradually subsided, leaving me questioning my sanity and the very nature of the world we comfortably inhabit. Was it a figment of an overworked imagination or a real creature of flesh and blood? And what was I going to tell those campers? My story isn't one of heroism or of a man conquering his fear. I didn't tell them about the dog man. I told them there was a mountain lion nearby and to get out. That seemed to work well enough. I can't imagine anyone would believe me not my supervisors and definitely not any of my friends. I never saw the creature again out there, but I have no doubt it is still lurking somewhere in the desert. I'm a park ranger at the Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. Now being a park ranger ain't exactly Ghostbusters, but this one night, let's say, it made me reconsider the job description. I've always loved nature, you know. It's something I take pride in, being one of the guardians of the park. I remember it was a Tuesday, around the third week of October. Picture perfect autumn day. It was one of the clearest nights I can remember. A lot of our work, although beautiful at times, can be quite routine. And I was doing the good old rounds that evening. I was mainly checking on the campsites and making sure the trails were clear. It had rained the previous day, and North Dakota's clay-rich soil gets pretty slippery when wet, a real nightmare for the weekend hikers. As I was patrolling, I'd occasionally stop to admire the scenery and watch the prairie dogs scuffling in the grass, or the sudden rush of nocturnal creatures waking up as the sun dipped below the horizon. I had just checked on the peaceful valley ranch, ensuring no enthusiastic wildlife photographer had decided to stay behind when I got a strange sensation. It started as a slight chill despite the fleece jacket I had on. I remember squinting my eyes in the deepening twilight, trying to adjust my vision. Something seemed off, 
The once vivacious prairies seemed unusually still. The hooting owls, the rustling grass, even the distant sounds of the little Missouri River. It was like someone had pressed mute on the remote. Then came a scent, light and flowery. Perfume? In the middle of the national park after sundown. I wrote it off thinking some picnicker might have left a bottle behind, and it was spreading due to the evening wind. But the wind was calm that evening, and the scent wasn't static. It felt like it was drifting, like someone passed by me doused in it. Next was a series of whispers. Yes, whispers. I turned around, expecting a troop of lost visitors, but I couldn't see anyone in the twilight. Yet, I was sure I heard someone. It wasn't like the winds carrying voices from the distant village either. These were close, like someone was whispering right behind me, a soft breeze carrying a single, indiscernible word. In my years as a park ranger, I have come across my share of weird experiences, but they mostly involved humans and their odd behaviors. This though, I was ill prepared for this. Up till then, I had passed off each odd occurrence as an isolated, explainable anomaly. The chill could just be the weather. The silence was maybe the predators lurking about. The flowery perfume may be an actual flower. The whispers were just the wind. But one after the other, all in a single evening patrol. It's not like I haven't been around these parts at night before. I just couldn't shake off the feeling that something, or maybe even someone was toying with me. I was on the verge of steering my jeep around and booking it. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw something moving. No, not moving, floating. I turned my flashlight in that direction, paling at the sight in front of me. There, several yards away, was a figure. It was a silhouette in human form, transparent yet vivid against the rolling darkness. Its lack of feet that should be touching the ground were replaced by tendrils of mist swirling around the air. It was in constant motion. A plethora of softer wisps danced around the more solid figure. I could audibly hear my heartbeat thundering inside my head, threatening to rip out of my chest. Strangely, though terrifying, it didn't seem threatening. It had a sorrowful air to it, the way it hovered there, the gentle swaying, like a sad, forgotten melody on repeat. I remember reaching out instinctively, not to touch it. God knows what would have happened if I did but more as an instinctive reflex of something you desire to reach out to rather than run away from. The figure seemed to respond. It turned and faced my direction, or at least I think it did. It had vacant, hollow spaces for eyes, yet I felt an intense gaze, a connection that sent shivers down my spine. The whispers grew louder, and this time around I could make out a single word, help, then it was gone, just like that disappeared leaving no trace behind. Only the soft smell of that flowery fragrance left to prove that it was not just my imagination. For a good ten minutes I sat on the jeep, numb, trying to make sense of it. Determined I circled the spot, aiming my flashlight in and out of the shrubs, as if the creature would pop a hand and say boo. But as you can guess, nothing happened. I spent the next two hours in the ranger's office fervently skimming through old records matching the description that I came across. There were stories, ghost stories, if you want to call them that, but each one was different from the next, each more puzzling and mysterious. When I finally left the office, I had more questions than answers. The next few days were strange, not because of the encounter, but rather because of the lack thereof. Part of me was relieved. I mean, who in their right mind would want to come across something like that each night? But another part was, how do I put it? curious. That park is not just a park for me anymore. It's become a personal journey of nature's endless mysteries, of secrets buried within herself, waiting to be unraveled. My day ends as usual, and the whistle of the night creatures begins. With a hot coffee keeping my senses wide awake, I leave my station with newfound respect for the night and its mysterious creatures. This one encounter, as spooky as it was, has changed my outlook towards my job and life in general. Thank you for letting me share this. Hey Donovan, I just got into your show, and boy do I have a story for you. I've been a government contractor for 30 years now. 
mostly mundane stuff, roads, bridges, that kind of thing. But a few years back, I got put on a slightly different job. It was in a research facility up in the Sierra Nevadas. Big place, armed guards, the whole nine yards. I never figured out exactly what they did there. All high-level stuff, classified, you know the drill. I wasn't there to ask questions anyway. I was there to replace some old pipes in the lower levels. All I had to do was my job and keep my nose clean. Let me tell you, I'm no stranger to working in creepy places. But this, this was something else. I had a badge, granted, but it didn't exactly open a lot of doors. Most of my work was underground, in the guts of the facility. I'd spend most of my day in tunnels lined with more pipes and cables than you can shake a stick at. Now, I started having this weird feeling right from the start. There was this constant low rumbling, like a garbage truck idling in the distance. I figured it was just the generators or whatever. But then, in my second week there, things started to get really spooky. It was a regular Tuesday, nothing special on the docket, just the usual pipe replacements. Down in the maze, you're surrounded by a ton of background noise, right? Vibrating pipes, chunky old HVAC units, dripping condensation. You kind of get used to it after a while. On this day, however, something was off. Deep in the heart of the labyrinth, I could hear an eerie, watery echo. A thump. It was strangely methodical. Like a gutter filling and emptying in a storm. It was unsettling. It made all my instincts scream danger into my ear. Yet, I convinced myself it was just another wonky pipe making all that noise and the smell. Ah well, the stench was dreadful too. Like spoiled meat left in a plastic bag. Mixed with what smelled like wet dog and a burning rubber sort of smell. I sure did have my reservations, but you don't usually get to talk back in my line of work. So I did what I always do. I pushed on. I followed the source of the sound, shouldering past bundles of cable, climbing over thick slices of reinforced concrete, this facility was like a rabbit warren, twisting and turning in all directions. And then, suddenly, it ended. There was this sealed, unmarked door. And being a naturally curious guy, and also the one who wasn't exactly keen on ignoring this mysterious clanging sound, I needed to check what's behind it. I pulled out my master key card. Now, remember Donovan, I'm just a plumber. But I've been working with these government guys long enough to know that most of the time, Access is all about status, and there are few things in this world that can't be overridden by a little hard work and some networking. Ah, screw it. I nervously swiped the card. The green light flickered. The door beeped and opened. And, well, it's like walking into a nightmare, you know. I was suddenly standing on the threshold of a monstrous pit, all steel and concrete, and right in the center was a cage. Not really a cage, more like a containment cell. I'll admit it, Donovan, I was scared. It was the kind of tight, gnawing fear that folds you up small and just leaves you there. I had worked in this facility for weeks, thinking of it as just another job. Now it felt like, like a horror story. That's when I saw it. I'm a big guy, Donovan, easily scrimmaging around 200 pounds. But the creature I saw in that cell would have towered over me even if it was crouched. It was huge, maybe seven, eight feet. It was difficult to tell, particularly when you're scared. The thing was, it was standing upright, not like a bear, but more human-like, all hunched and bulky with it. It was dark in there. The lighting inside the cell was barely functional, flicking on and off. Yet, I managed a glimpse of it. Its body looked like a perfect mix of hyena and man, long snout, demonic-looking face, and earthy, musky, dark brown fur covering it. The strength it exuded was obvious. A big chest, wide shoulders, just impeccably terrifying. And the sound it made, like a guttural growl, but low, very, very low. Panicked, I punched a button, and the door came slipping shut. I stumbled backward, tripping over my gear, trying to put as much distance between me and that, that thing as possible. I didn't go back to work after that day. I didn't even collect my stuff. I didn't say goodbye to anyone. I just left. I left the creature, the dog man, behind me in that pit of hell. Probably they wondered what happened to that contractor who suddenly vanished one day. 
but the memory of that chilling encounter stayed with me every single night. I thought about reporting it to authorities, but who would have believed me? Yeah, I met a werewolf in a government facility. You guys should look into it. That story might make for a great movie, but to me, it is a grim reality. Faced with the fact that such a creature exists and that our government is covering up its existence made me feel incredibly small in a world I thought I understood. So Donovan, that's why I decided I should share this on your show. I don't know the truth about that creature, whether it was a test subject or something found in the wild. All I know is that it felt like a dark secret that we all have a right to know. Who knows how many of such creatures are lurking around captive in secret spots, away from human reach, controlled for God knows what purposes. The truth is, we don't exactly know what's out there, but it's time we find out. It's time we know the truth. That's my story, Donovan. Do with it what you will. So, I have a strange story. It's about something I encountered in the woods outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, that I never felt right keeping to myself. Now, I'm a retired widower, and there isn't much to do when the rest of the world's turned in for the night. It gives me time to spend with Daisy, my bloodhound. After decades spent wrestling with the daily grind, these days I'm much more interested in the call of the wild, the quiet of nature. So, Daisy and I took to spending our days in the woods, training in survival skills. You know, building a shelter, starting a fire without a lighter, those sorts of things. Hours turned into days, days into weeks, and weeks into months in those woods. Daisy and I were working on setting up camp. She'd fetch me sticks for the fire, tail wagging all the while, and I'd made a makeshift shelter and a circle of rocks for the fire. I was just about to start working on gathering kindling when a low growl rumbled through the calm late afternoon. I straightened up, glancing down at Daisy. She stood frozen, ears pricked up, her tail hanging straight. I'd never seen her act like this, not in all our time out there. I figured it was probably a deer or something. You know, the woods are full of animals all minding their own business. But Daisy didn't relax. Her growl grew deeper, her eyes fixed on something in the tree line that I couldn't see. I squinted into the deepening darkness, feeling the first prickle of unease. Beads of sweat started trickling down my back, hot and sticky. But it wasn't the humidity. There was something about the low rumble in Daisy's throat a rare hostility in her eyes that made me uncomfortable. Then I heard the movement of leaves in the distance, a twig snapping, the thunderous rush of something big moving quickly, too quickly, through the underbrush. I remember a smell. It was a whiff of something foul. It hit me like a strong gust of wind, a nauseating combination of fetid swamp and sulfur. I didn't know what was there, and let me tell you I couldn't have guessed if I tried. All I could do was trust that Daisy sensed danger, and Lord knows she hasn't ever been wrong about this sort of thing before. All my senses were alert, but nothing could prepare me for the looming figure that stepped out of the shadows. Enhancing the mystery of it all, what I saw in that moment was hard to understand, let alone describe. It was tall and stood, I'd swear to anyone, at least six feet. It blocked out the remaining daylight, ink black against the setting sun. Its body was muscled, almost skeletal, and there was God, how can I put it, a bizarre scariness to it as it rustled and shifted. It was like a dragon, maybe, or a bat. Its glow-in-the-dark eyes were fixed on me, burning with intensity like the hot embers of a raging fire. It was at that moment I realized that Daisy and I weren't alone. I could hear the thing breathing, taking deep, raspy breaths that seemed to echo eerily through the clearing. I can't tell you what it looked like, not properly. It was the most peculiar creature, like nothing I'd seen on Animal Planet or in any of the zoos. Daisy's growl was the only thing that felt reassured, and just when a part of me wanted to bolt, something else held me rooted to the spot. A strange sense of fascination, or was it fear? It's hard to say. I got to my feet clutching onto Daisy. That's when the beast roared. I say roared because it wasn't like any animal noise I'd ever heard. It was a blood-curdling, raspy hack. It was like something ripped straight out of the pits of hell. Still, 
consider me foolhardy, but I held my ground. Daisy was shaking like a leaf, but she was meticulously trained and didn't run. I wanted to get a better look, even though every instinct was screaming at me to run. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I discerned a sort of exterior skeleton. Its body was a horrid blend of animal and goblin-like features, with a tint of something eerily human. Its face seemed twisted into a semi-permanent sneer of ridicule, or maybe just sadistic pleasure. The eyes were not the soft, luminescent dots they first appeared to be. They were glowingly malevolent, like twin fiery orbs. Its body, long and skeletal, glistened with a dark, almost scaled skin. I saw something that seemed a cross between bat-like wings and a lizard's body. The defining moment was when it unfurled its colossal hawked legs, making its entire figure stretch to nearly ten feet. And there, protruding from its skull, were two grotesque horns. Our gaze met. Then, faster than my mind could comprehend, the creature lurched towards us. I reacted instinctively, pulling Daisy and running towards where I thought our camp was. Behind me, I could hear the frenzied beast giving chase. The way Daisy was growling at it, I knew the danger was as real as it gets. We reached the makeshift camp, got in our rusted pickup, and raced out of there. The creature had halted at the edge of the forest line, its unwavering eyes glowing ominously in the light from the tail lamp of the vehicle. As I drove away, I watched it watch me through the rear view mirror until it was just a blip against the landscape. I spent many nights after that, staring out into the dark, gnawing on my nails and wondering if what I'd seen was real. The thought kept me awake more often than not. Daisy was upset for a while, but soon got back to her playful self. But even she couldn't erase the disquiet that had settled in me. Weeks later, I met an old hunter at the local watering hole, who used to explore those very woods. When I related my story, there was neither disbelief nor mockery in his eyes. Instead, he whispered something that made goosebumps break out onto my flesh. Jersey Devil. According to him, this creature has been seen by only a handful of the residents over the years. But who knows? What I do know is that from that day on, I had my tales to tell. Would I ever go back? Probably not. But the forests with their enticing wilderness still hold an eternal allure to a man like me. For however terrifying the encounter was, it reminded me of the mystery that's the world we live in. I really think that others need to hear this tale. So, I wanted to share something a bit offbeat, a personal incident that happened to me a couple of years back in the quiet city of Burlington, Vermont. Now, I'm not much of talker or storyteller, but trust me, this is something worth sharing. One of my favorite leisure activities is bird watching. You may find it boring, but I've got to tell you, it's the perfect blend of science and magic. So it's midsummer, and I am heading out to the lake for an early morning bird watching session. The morning's crisp weather was refreshing, and I felt the jitters of excitement and anticipation that come along every time I head out with my binoculars in hand. The birds were lively and chirping and I was listing down species making mental and paper notes. I spotted an oriole, a sparrow, a couple of robins enjoying the day, and even a blue jay. However, there was something unusual in the air, a pungent, musty smell that I could barely describe, almost like skunk spray. It was strong and felt incredibly out of place for such a lush, beautiful spot. I remember shrugging that off, reasoning that nature can be a little wild sometimes, a few hours into my observation and jotting routine, I hear this deep, low growling sound echoing about the peaceful lake. It wasn't a bird's chirp, that's for sure. It wasn't even a sound I'd ever associate with any of the animals I've familiarized myself with over the years. It was a rough, guttural sound, like some massive creature was clearing its throat. And then, there was this ridiculous shaking amongst a thicket of trees nearby. I saw the bushes and branches sway with some considerable force, making it clear that whatever was creating that sound was pretty dang big. The birds went silent, tucking into the trees as if on cue. Now, I won't pretend I wasn't scared, because I was. But curiosity has a way of overruling fear, doesn't it? So, 
I crept closer, camera in hand, praying that it would be a deer or something more familiar. But what I saw, bloody hell, I wish I could simply describe it. But I'll just set the scene for you as best I can. I was looking at a thing with a broad hunched over back, no discernible neck and large shoulders that gave it a linebacker's profile. Even hunched, it had to be well over six feet. Tangled shreds of brown and reddish hair stuck out in patches, akin to a bear with a bad hair day. All I was thinking at that moment was the simple truth of, boy, I don't think I've seen anything like this before. As I slowly approached this creature, my heart pounded in my chest. I could feel fear ripple through me, but still I pressed on. I might have made a murmur of a sound because it turned to face me. Suddenly, I was staring into the beady black eyes of a creature from another world. I say creature because quite frankly I have no good name for what I saw. This wasn't just an outlandishly large bear. I mean sure it was like a bear in many ways, but with a strong brow ridge leading up to a cone-shaped head. You could liken it to a Neanderthal of sorts, but much, much scarier. Its face had whiskers bridging the gap between its strong pronounced lips and bridged nose. It was built like a professional football player, buff, heavily muscled, and incredibly large. And for one terrifying moment, it almost seemed like this thing was appraising me just as I was appraising it. The creature gave another one of those deep, rumbling sounds, making my skin prickle. I didn't wait to see what would happen next. I bolted away, sprinting much faster than I ever have in my life. I made it back to my car heart pounding a samba in my chest and my hands shaking. I didn't look back. I just got inside the car, turned the ignition on, and drove away as fast as I could. Let me tell you something. It took me a whole lot of courage to walk back into those woods again after that. And bird watching hasn't been the same since. Each rustling leaf, each unknown animal call always takes me back to that encounter. It was a harrowing experience to say the least. Later, when I shared my experience with a buddy, initially he just told me I'd probably just run afoul of a sickly bear. I think he was being nice and trying to make me feel better, but when I gave him the details he started listening more seriously. He said he'd heard of a similar incident from another person from Burlington who was an avid hiker, but he didn't believe it at the time. So now I count the creature among the remarkable sights I've seen on my walks. I only wish I'd had the presence of mind to take a photo. But then again, even without one, I don't think I will ever forget what I saw that day in the woods of Burlington. So that's my story. Do with it what you will. I'm still not quite sure what it was I encountered that sunny day in Asheville, North Carolina. It's the kind of place where you can't help but feel small, surrounded by vast open sky and the age-old mountains. It was perfect weather for a mountain bike ride. Little did I know, I was about to experience something that would deeply affect me. I've always been an adrenaline junkie, and mountain biking has been my poison of choice for a number of years now. There's just something so liberating about tearing down dirt trails, your heart pounding in your chest, your bike thrashing beneath you, and Asheville with its sprawling mountain ranges had always been on my biking bucket list. The day started just like any other perfect mountain biking adventure. I was pumped, my senses heightened, throttling down one of my favorite trails, a scenic ribbon of dirt and rocks and roots twisting along the side of the mountain. The trail followed the line of the mountain. It was a perfectly molded single track paired with breathtaking views. The sweet tang of pine, the cool mountain air, the sunlight filtering through the trees. It was exactly my definition of paradise. But then, something shifted. Have you ever had that feeling where something just feels off? That's exactly what it felt like. I took a break from my ride to take in the surrounding beauty and to hydrate. The sun was hanging low and the sinews of evening light were beginning to suffuse the edges of the sky. That's when I felt it. A creepy sensation prickling up my spine. An undercurrent of something not quite right. I shrugged it off as the setting day playing tricks on me and was about to mount my bike again when I heard it, a rustling somewhere behind the tree line. The rustling grew louder, more deliberate. The hair on my neck stood on end, and my stomach churned. As a biker, 
I'm not a stranger to wildlife or their sounds. Yet this felt different. The rustling seemed to morph into a low, sickening groan that echoed around the subdued forest. An earthy, musky smell quickly followed. It was pungent, and quite unlike anything I'd smelled before, it was almost nauseating. Stumbling backward, my eyes darted through the dimming woods to the source of the noise. There it was, or rather, there it wasn't. Nothing was visible. I could only sense the menacing outline of something indistinct, something existing mostly in my mind, fueled by my fear and its strange, heavy presence. The shadow seemed to come alive. Its presence seemed to show itself and then disappear. And yet, every nerve in my body screamed of its undeniable existence. I strained my ears, hoping to pick up any familiar sound that might explain the mystery. But what followed next was anything but familiar in the woods. It was a soft, eerie laughter. Unease swelled within me. I knew I wasn't alone, but identifying what was with me was trickier. My instincts told me to get the hell out of there, but my curiosity rooted me. With every passing moment, the events around me were getting stranger. Desperate to retain my sanity, I decided to confront it. Whatever it was. Standing tall, I called out. I tried to sound brave but my voice echoed back from the woods. What was happening? What was this unseen presence plaguing my adventure? And why did it feel like my life was about to change forever? Suddenly, a figure emerged from the dark veil of the forest, emanating an uncanny aura that was filled with dread. My breath hitched in my throat as I tried to make out the silhouette. It was tall yet unnaturally slender. Its body seemed fluid-like, shifting and twitching unnervingly. It had a peculiar gait that was both intriguing and terrifying. I felt like a deer caught in headlights as I squinted to get a better look. Trying to make sense of what I was seeing, a sudden flash of golden lights pierced the thickening dusk. Its eyes, glowing in a vivid shade of gold, bore into mine. Hanging in midair, they looked surreal, revealing nothing about the creature. It was then that I heard it, a sound so out of the blue that my mind struggled to make sense of it an uncanny mimicry of my own voice repeating the words I had just shouted. My blood ran cold at the sound. It felt like the forest was whispering back to me in my own voice. Without thought, my body finally submitted to the rush of adrenaline. I yanked my bike off the ground, jumped back on, and pedaled away as hard as I could with the strange creature's gaze boring into my back. Not daring to glance back, I focused on the trail ahead leaning into the bike and relying on my muscle memory to navigate the familiar terrain. By the time I broke out of the tree line and onto open ground, it was starting to get dark. I didn't stop until I could no longer hear the blood pounding in my ears, until a comfortable distance separated me from the strange presence I had left behind. As I look back at that encounter now, my memories are filled with unease and unanswered questions. Was it real? Was it a guardian of the mountains? or an entity with more sinister motives. Obviously, I had emerged from the encounter unharmed, but I couldn't shake off the lingering sensation. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months. Yet the memory of that encounter kept me awake on most nights. Each time I rode my bike through the mountains, I could feel its unseen gaze upon me. I couldn't ignore the soft rustling of leaves, the unnatural sounds that echoed amongst the quiet mountains. For in the end, we are all just wanderers, getting lost in our adventures to find who we truly are. And hopefully we can all see what the world actually is. So, I've got a story for you that's sure to send some chills down your spine, no matter how cozy you might be feeling at the moment. This one is from my cross-country skiing escapade in Wyoming that I cannot seem to forget. This took place many winters ago, when I had decided to take off from work for a week and indulge in my passion for cross-country skiing. I love the solitude and the rhythm that you fall into, the sensation of being one with nature. Born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the local landscapes were my playground since I was a child. I remember setting off early that day. The sun was just shy of touching the horizon and the pristine snow was untouched, the wind cutting against my face, the rhythm of the skis beneath my feet. 
and the faint crunching sound was all part of this winter symphony that I cherished. As I glided along my favorite skiing territory, I felt something different that day. The air had this particular chill, not the usual winter cold that I was acquainted with. It was eerie, a bit unsettling. Despite having traversed these paths for years, something seemed off, significantly enough to make the hairs at the back of my neck stand. I shrugged it off initially, attributing it to the unusually harsh winter that year. I continued my path, the skis slicing through the thick blanket of snow, my breath appearing as small clouds before me. While I was lost in the rhythm, a sudden whiff of something strange caught me off guard. It was a mix of different odors, wet dog, the nauseating smell of garbage, and something else that I could not quite point out. Ignoring this odd change in scenery, I proceeded on my path. The skies were gradually turning from orange to blue, and the vast white wilderness had an ethereal glow. The feeling of unease was growing inside me like a gnawing pit in my stomach, contrasting sharply with the calm solitude of the landscape. All the while, the stench kept getting stronger, a fetid mix of rotting meat and a tinge of something like sulfur. It was so strong that I had to stop to gather myself. I looked around me, hoping to spot an animal carcass anything to explain the smell. A sudden deep guttural sound made me snap my head around. The noise was animalistic, a growl that seemed to boom in the desolate silence of the wilderness. I strained my eyes to peer into the snow clouds that my skis had just kicked up. A sense of foreboding overtook me, the deafening silence serving as a harsh reminder that I was indeed very much alone. And what happened next was insane. I remember seeing a sudden movement from the corner of my eye. There was a figure that was definitely not human, standing where no living creature should be. Its silhouette was curiously off, as if it wasn't supposed to be there, yet it was. I squinted trying to make out the obscurity, but it ducked behind a cluster of trees. I could see it pacing. Its predatory gait sent a fresh wave of chill creeping over me. Then the movement stopped, and I realized that it was observing me. Curiosity warred with fear in my mind as I let my eyes fixate on the place. I saw it emerge, almost reluctantly, its figure unclear against the snowy background. It was massive, towering at about nine feet. There was a hump on its back that I couldn't understand. The creature had a dark coat that was a mixed meld of black and browns, and a mane around its neck that flowed down like a cloak. It stood upright, standing on its hind legs which were eerily similar to human legs. But these were muscular, bulkier, and clearly powerful. Its face was demonic, a twisted version of a hyena's that housed a double row of teeth in its grotesquely long snout. The eyes gleamed. A low primal growl rumbled out from it, echoing ominously in the silent, wintry air. That was my breaking point. The sight, smell, and sound sinking together in a horrifying reality. I will never forget the surge of adrenaline that engulfed me. I turned on my heel, a frantic energy bubbling inside me, and took off at a pace I didn't know I was capable of. I could hear the sounds of my frantic heartbeat resonating in the haunting silence. I never looked back, not until I had crossed the threshold of my house, the safety of solid walls barricading me from the wilderness and its inhabitants. The memory of that encounter out there in the wilderness still lingers with me to this day. It is a haunting reminder of the reality we often ignore. The peace and serenity I once found in my skiing escapades have now been stained with this gruesome encounter. Every time I set foot in the snow or feel the winter air seeping into my skin, I'm reminded of that eerie sensation and those hypnotic eyes watching me from afar. It's been years now, but every time I recall the incident, it unfurls in me a dread so cold and deep that it never fails to send shivers down my spine. I later was told that what I encountered was known as Dogman, but I'm not sure because I don't know enough about them. They said it is a creature from the twilight zone of humanity that continues to lurk in the shadows of our awareness. What do you think?